All right. Um, welcome to NewsHawk Talks. I'm Bill McFadden, founder and publisher of NewsHawk, Santa Barbara County's leading source of local news. Our guest today is my friend Greg Hart, who is the Santa, uh, Santa Barbara County Second District Supervisor and the current chairman of the Board of Supervisors. A couple of programming notes. Um, despite all the hiccups, and I promise you for the third one that we do, we will get these worked out um, if I have to kill myself before then. But um, we, uh, the webcast is supposedly being live streamed on NewsHawk's homepage. I'm guessing. And also to our Facebook page. Later today, it will be, it will be uploaded to our YouTube channel. Um, we asked for reader questions in advance and we got dozens. I've incorporated a, a few of your questions into my own and we'll ask a few more during the webcast. We'll try to uh, get answers to as many as we can and we'll post those on NewsHawk later. I know I promised to do that last week, but bear with us. Uh, the breaking news never stops around here, especially during this twin catastrophe we've got going on, as I know you all are painfully aware. Um, we've got a half hour today. Uh, Greg has uh, graciously agreed to extend uh, his time. Um, so let's get started. And I had asked Greg to provide us with a quick update on Santa Barbara County's latest news on the coronavirus uh, crisis and the response. So Greg, I'm gonna turn this over to you and, and hopefully it's all gonna work. Well, thank you, Bill, and thank you to NewsHawk for putting this on. And I am really impressed by all the work that you and your team do every day delivering local news to our community. It's a, you're a critical resource. I rely on you um, myself first thing in the morning, checking uh, the, the website and getting information. And it's, you're doing a wonderful job, really appreciate it. This is obviously an extraordinary time in our community and we are all working very hard together to try and get through this. Um, I'm, I'm so proud of our community and the work that we're all doing together to protect each other. This is not easy. This weekend in particular, I think is gonna be very difficult because of the hot weather. But um, to date, our community has really risen to this moment and met the challenge and we are doing what we need to do to protect each other. And um, we just need to stay the course. There isn't a date um, that the governor has announced as to when he would begin to loosen uh, significantly the stay-at-home order, but um, we're hopeful and we're going to be prepared at Santa Barbara County to make sure that we're ready when that moment comes. Well, thank you and thanks for the compliments. Um, that's really helpful. And by the way, I just wanted to say um, on behalf of Team NewsHawk and our readers, um, we really appreciate the, the unified command briefings you guys do almost every day. I know this ain't our first rodeo when it comes to disasters around here, but um, those sessions generally are really important and informative. So um, thank you for, for doing those. The big question I have, and I've been pushing our staff on this, is what's going on with the Lompoc Federal Penitentiary? It seems that that facility seems to be accounting for almost all of the spike in co uh, coronavirus cases in Santa Barbara County. And the Bureau of Prisons, the Federal Bureau of Prisons response and transparency have been, to be candid, inexcusable. Um, can you tell us anything that um, you're hearing uh, with that and, and how the, the, the federal government is working with the county to, to get control of that situation? Well, the good news is that um, the Bureau of Prisons is working today to stand up a mobile field hospital on the prison grounds so that they can contain um, some of the patients that they are that are coming from the prison on their own grounds and keep them out of our medical system. We have really asked for a lot of assistance from our congressional representatives, Lude Carbajal and Diane Feinstein and, and Senator Harris have all been very helpful, aggressively communicating to the Bureau of Prisons that we need their assistance and we need it fast. And the good news is that they are responding and they are bringing the materials and the equipment and the staff to Lompoc to set up that field hospital. So there's good news to report in that respect. And then also um, the number of positive cases that have been coming out of the prison has been reducing over the, the past week or so and um, things are getting better. Unfortunately, we had an uptick on positive cases in Santa Barbara yesterday. So that was actually the place where there were more uh, reported positive cases than in Lompoc. But overall, you know, because of what our community has been doing to socially distance mm -hmm. and follow the, the hygiene recommendations that the public health department has issued, we are bending the infection curve and are doing a fabulous job and our medical system has capacity. So the original crisis that had us all concerned that we would replicate the situation in Italy or New York, 
um, has not transpired here and is looking less likely every day. Yeah, that is good news. Appreciate that. Um, so speaking of the, the stay at home order though, um, that order from Governor Newsom has been in place for more than a month now. Um, we know the coronavirus has roughly a 14 day incubation period, which means that for at least the last two weeks, we've been seeing the impact of, of the stay at home order on hospitalizations in Santa Barbara County in particular. And we know the numbers will remain low for the next two weeks because of the compliance um, has been really high, on, at least on the South Coast. Um, how many weeks of data does the county really need to review before it can determine that we've substantially altered the trajectory of the virus? Do you, do you know? Well, I think what's important to recognize is that the governor, through his statewide stay-at-home order, is controlling local jurisdictions' response and ability to change that order. There, the governor's order um, applies to every jurisdiction in the state of California and every citizen in the state of California. And during emergencies like this pandemic, the governor's um, executive orders have the full weight and force of law. So local governments can take additional steps beyond the parameters of the governor's order to impose additional local restrictions to protect public health and safety at the local level as circumstances um, require, but we cannot reduce or lessen or lift the governor's order. So we're in a position of waiting for um, the entire state to be responsive and have the same kind of medical uh, success story that we're seeing here in Santa Barbara County so that the governor feels confident um, to, to begin to, to as he's uh, determined it, not use a light switch, but instead use a dimmer switch and to try and calibrate appropriately the right level of restrictions that would apply um, to the state of California. So we're, we're working really hard at the local level to position ourselves to make sure that we have met all of the conditions of the governor's framework. He has identified six elements of his framework that have to be in place before he will begin to move that dimmer switch. And we're, we are working diligently and consistently to make that happen here in Santa Barbara County. The first and most obvious one is you know, the testing capability to make sure that we know what's going on with the virus and that we can report that up through the state's public health system and make sure that they know what's going on. All of the public health departments in the state of California are doing the same thing. And unfortunately, the availability of tests and um, as importantly, the ability to track and trace and isolate and quarantine positive cases is widely disparate around the state of California. Mm -hmm. There is no one system that, that guarantees that each county has what it needs to fulfill its part of this framework. So we're all doing the best we can and working really hard to make it work. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it, from the governor's perspective, looking at it statewide, that we're all in the same place. Has he given any, any indication that, that he would not look at this as, you know, all 58 counties moving at once? That, you know, if, if a county like Santa Barbara County, because really that's all News Hawk is concerned about, uh, if, if Santa Barbara County is, is ahead of the curves for a lot of the, uh, many of the, the metrics that he's using, um, would he allow us to, to move forward? Do, have you had any indication on that? He has not spoken directly to that at all. But I do think that one of the big concerns at the state level is um, travel between areas, you know, and what, what do they do about that? And there has been very little guidance, haven't seen actually anything um, from the governor's press conferences or any of the, the bulletins that the Department of Health has put out that address that issue. And that's gonna, it has to be a big concern. You know, we're 100 miles away from 20 million people where the COVID outbreak is really um, active and, and a current challenge. So that is part of, I'm sure, of his calculus looking at the whole state of California. But again, we want to be ready here locally when and if he does say, yes, specific geographic areas that are, have got a better handle on things, you know, could begin to open businesses more readily than others. And uh, we're standing up a task force and developing a plan collaboratively with businesses and medical experts to make sure that each individual business has a plan in place so that it can fulfill you know, the hygiene requirements, the operational requirements, and the social distancing requirements that will, will obviously clearly be necessary moving forward. Right. Great. Um, would you mind talking a little bit about the REACH um, process? Um, the, both the Goleta and Santa Barbara Chambers of Commerce have been working on something, other, uh, something else this week. So uh, 
we've not been quite as focused on that as, as uh, we, we probably should have been, but um, going forward, we, we will be active participants in that. So um, if you could out elaborate a little bit more on what, what we can expect, um, I think that would be helpful for our business audience. There's an organization that is primarily based in San Luis Obispo County. You described it as REACH. It was originally called Hourglass. And what they were doing was long-term economic recovery and revitalization work in San Luis Obispo County in relation to the closure of the Diablo Canyon nuclear power plant and then extending into northern Santa Barbara County, realizing that the geographic proximity of those two places had a certain synergy. We've asked them to take those relationships and that network and the planning that they've done already in San Luis Obispo County to help us jumpstart that effort countywide here in Santa Barbara. So we're using their expertise and the model that they've already developed in San Luis Obispo County to get us to that position faster. So we've contracted with them we're going to be convening um, stakeholders beginning next week to put our own particular unique Santa Barbara flavor into that process and to get us a product you know, as fast as possible. So that when, as I said before, the governor begins to turn that dimmer switch and give local governments more authority to open up more businesses that we will be ready uh, to meet that challenge. Okay, and what is, uh, what is your timeline? Um, there's, there's been a lot of talk about a four to six week period and on our business roundtable I called this morning, uh, County Fire Chief Mark Hartwig explained that that was, that was an initial estimate and that that was probably not accurate today. But um, can you talk about, about that timeline and what you expect? Yeah, I think that's exactly right. That was just an estimate initially. We're, we're going to go as fast as we possibly go. The only thing that's going to limit that is, you know, the ability of us to, to collaborate and come to resolution of these qu issues quickly. And given the urgency and the, the sense of the moment and the imperative that we have, you know, everybody's going to be working collaboratively fast and, and we'll be ready. Okay, great. Um, so in, in, the, in the spirit of collaboration and regionalism and, and uh, which I know you worked on very hard as part of the SBCAG. Um, are, are you looking at additional ways that Santa Barbara County can work with both uh, San Luis Obispo and Ventura counties um, as a result of the, you know, we're forced to do this now, but maybe this isn't such a bad thing going forward? Yeah, there's been a lot of collaboration between the public health officers in Ventura County and San Luis Obispo County and Santa Barbara County. We also have um, elected leadership on regular conference calls talking between the three counties. Supervisor, or excuse me, Congressman Carvajal, Assemblymember Lamone, and Senator Jackson hosted a tele teleconference this past week with leaders from Ventura County and Santa Barbara County. So we are, we are constantly trying to collaborate and find out the best practices. Uh, one of the interesting things that might be confusing to people is the differences in um, what facilities have been closed in different counties. Mm -hmm. And that gets back to the point that I made at the beginning when, when the governor issued his statewide order, it applies to all jurisdictions. But for example, in Ventura County, they took that a step further and closed their beaches um, and golf courses and um, trails. Since then, because of their unique local situation getting better, they have reopened those facilities. In Santa Barbara County, we didn't close our beaches or our trails because we didn't think that was necessary. So there, there are unique variations on um, extensions of the governor's order, but everybody is fundamentally bound by that and can't loosen those restrictions or lift the, the closures of businesses um, ahead of the governor taking action. Okay. Um, Sort of along those same lines, uh, specifically for county parks, uh, you know, picnic areas. Those are those are closed, but the parks are open. And, and you know, other than the picnic area, picnic benches and uh, playgrounds, you can go to the parks and whatnot. Um, is there is that specifically? Are those those structures specifically, um, you know, part of the governor's order, or, or is that something that, that the, the county could could do on, on say a weekend like this? Be prepared to have extra sanitation available to, to wipe those things down. Yeah, we're trying hard to communicate, number one, that if folks really just focus on the fact that we should not be clustering in groups and we should not be getting too close to each other. The, the message that I deliver every single day at the press conferences is, you know, try and be smart about how you're exercising outdoors. Obvious, obviously, people need to get outdoors. outdoors. It's part of being healthy. It's, it's important for mental health. But you know, how you do it 
is important. If you're planning to go to the beach to get a walk, if you're planning to go on a hike, think about the fact that when you arrive, there may be too many people there already and that you need to have a plan B in mind or, or plan to go at a different time that would obviously not be so busy. This weekend in particular, this will be a challenge. It's going to be very hot. Folks are going to want to cool off at the beach in the middle of the hot afternoon. You know, I, I understand that. I feel that myself. Uh, but if you want to go to the beach, it's probably smarter to get there early. You know, get your walk in at eight or nine o'clock in the morning. There won't be hardly any people. If you're hiking, the same kind of thing. So we just have to be smart and, um, and considerate of others. And, and to a great extent, an impressive, amazing extent, I think people really have been doing that in our community. I see more people wearing face masks when I'm at the store. You know, people understand the consequences of this and want to be part of the solution. Mm -hmm. True. Um, I've got a couple of reader questions here that I wanted to, to throw out. Um, one was, uh, this is a little bit long, but when are we going to be able to get real information on the individuals who have tested positive for COVID-19 and which of those have required medical att attention, hospitalization, intensive care, those kinds of things? Um, because uh, and for this reader was pointing out that, you know, just saying that it was North County, a 60 year old male doesn't really help us um, understand it better, but is there a way that the county, you know, still complying with HIPAA rules and regulations um, can release some of that information so the public has a better understanding of who is at risk in our county? That's a really great question. And I know people would like to have more information about that, but, but you hit the nail on the head. The Federal Patient Privacy Act uh, protects our medical records and gives us that presumption of privacy about what, um, what's available to the public about our own personal medical condition. And that is a really important value and, you can, and if you think about it in terms of the next phase of our response to the coronavirus, you know, we missed the first opportunity to have mass testing and tracking and tracing of cases when the first outbreak happened. And that you know, has put us in this situation where we had to have the statewide stay-at-home order to avoid collapsing our medical system. As we have bent the infection curve and we're moving into a different phase, it'll be more important than ever to be able to test and track and trace individuals. And, and th that system will rely on people's cooperation. You know, if you're symptomatic, we want you to get tested and we want you to cooperate with the quarantine recommendation that we're gonna give those folks. If we are at the same time advertising people and, and sharing information about their personal medical condition to a, a granularity that makes them uncomfortable, they are not gonna participate and, and, and help us in that task of containing the virus. So this is a really important point and it's really um, gonna be more important going forward because we expect to have to have, you know, hundreds of people hired by the county or the state of California to go out and track down these individual cases and all of their contacts. So it's not just the positive COVID-19 patient, but all the people that they've been in contact with to, to check in with them to find out whether or not they've been exposed and potentially are positive. So working through that whole system requires tremendous cooperation from the community and trust that their private medical information is, um, is not gonna be exposed to the public. Yeah, you know, that's, that's gonna be an interesting question going forward with the, uh, you know, the recent uh, emphasis on privacy and privacy protections, especially in California. So um, how, how we as a community, as we, we as a society play that out is gonna be quite fascinating for years to come. What, what, will, what, will, what will we accept on our individual liberties and what won't we? Um, another reader question, while the federal government has implemented multiple fiscal and regulatory relief measures for the American people and commerce, shouldn't the state of California and Santa Barbara County also be reviewing things like the minimum wage and living wage requirements as overregulation in these most trying times? Well, I, I think that this, the economic impact of the coronavirus is significant and, um, and ferocious and very difficult for everybody. Um, I'm not a fan of the idea of imposing additional burdens on the lowest wage workers in the economy. The idea that you know, we would take people who are making the minimum wage and reduce their incomes as part of an economic development strategy, to me, doesn't, doesn't seem like a good course of action. I, I think what we really need to do is just focus on 
you know, making sure that the public health threat has been minimized so that we can phase forward opening up businesses and, you know, do everything that we can to make sure that they're ready. There's so many creative, um, ingenious entrepreneurs that are ready to get back to work and to make their operations successful. Um, they are, they are adapting as we speak. Those that are closed have moved online. Restaurants are doing takeout. There's a million examples. Businesses have, have pivoted on a dime and are now producing personal protective equipment for medical institutions. You know, we don't, we don't need to revisit old uh, public policy issues. We just need to open the doors when we're ready and get people back to work. Speaking of those lower, lower paid uh, employees and workers, um, poverty obviously is, a, is a, a leading indicator for population health and, and there's all kinds of, uh, you know, uh, problems associated with that going, that are long-term problems that we're gonna have to deal with. Um, what's the county, um, what's the discussion been at the county about that risk? That the, you know, we already have a fairly high poverty rate in, in Santa Barbara County. Is it going to get worse? And what are we going to do as a as a community to uh, to alleviate that, or at least um, keep it as steady as we can? Well, that's one of the the most important challenges that county government, in particular, faces. We are the agent of the state that delivers um, social services to the residents that need assistance. You know, the state sets the parameters of those programs, and then we implement them. and And when we have the the resources to do that, we can supplement those and make those more meaningful and beneficial to people. But one of the biggest challenges that we have unique to Santa Barbara County is that we have not been a direct recipient of federal funding to help ameliorate the, the costs that we're incurring for the coronavirus. The, the first tranche of federal funding that went out with the CARES Act only applied to counties and cities that had more than 500,000 people in population. So for example, in Ventura County, that county, it is twice the size of Santa Barbara County, but it got $147 million from the federal government to help them with the costs that they're incurring and in, in expanding the healthcare system to treat COVID patients and to identify them, and also to backfill the lost revenue that they're experiencing from the economic shutdown. Santa Barbara County got zero from that federal allocation. We're working really closely with uh, Congressman Carbajal and our, our U.S. Senators to have that inequity addressed in the next round of federal local assistance funding, and we're hopeful that that will be better and more beneficial. But the county is looking at a $40 million um, hit, both mm -hmm. on the cost side and on the revenue side, and that's going to affect our ability to deliver services, both public safety services and social services. And you know, the critical safety net that we've tried to create here to protect people from poverty is threatened by you know, the continuation of the, the business shutdown and the government shutdown. And, um, and the failure to, to be compensated by those first initial federal stimulus uh, efforts. Right. And uh, speaking of the, the county's budget and that hole that, you're, that we're, we're facing, um, what, are, what are some of the discussions to, uh, to fill that? Um, what can we do? Well, in the very short run, fortunately, my board colleagues have been working for a long time to develop a strategic reserve here at, at the County of Santa Barbara. Similarly, uh, where I used to be uh, elected in the Santa Barbara City Council, uh, a large strategic reserve exists there. So the first thing that will happen is that we'll have to tap into those emergency reserves and begin to, to keep our balanced budget. But that is not sustainable. We won't be able to continue to do that. Um, so we desperately need the help of the state, our state and federal partners to help us meet the needs of our local residents. Okay. Um, Let's, uh, let's get personal a little bit. Um, how has this crisis affected you and your family personally? Um, you know, what are you doing to, to keep yourself healthy and, and, uh, and, and sane? I know this isn't what you signed up for when you agreed to be chairman of the board. <laughs> well, it's a, it's a serious challenge and I'm 100% focused on it. Um, there really isn't any extra um, time. There is a new issue every day and we're doing the best. There are so many people working so hard, putting in incredible hours, you know, at all levels of government. Um, I talk regularly with my local elected official colleagues around the county and know that they are as committed as I am to helping do the best we can to get businesses back on their feet and, to, and more, most importantly, to protect our local residents from this very terrible circumstances. But it, it hits me personally. My, my son and his girlfriend uh, both lost their jobs very quickly into this. They were working you know, um, in the hospitality business and relied a lot on tips 
for their income and they have applied for unemployment but haven't gotten any checks yet. It, that system is overwhelmed and it's been very difficult to access. Uh, my 89 year old mom had her birthday about two weeks ago and we were not able to celebrate with her because we want to protect her health. She's home isolating and um, that was you know one of those important family milestones that we unfortunately missed. My um, nephew who lives up in the Bay Area was tested positive for COVID-19 and had serious uh, medical situation with that. Fortunately, he's recovering now, but um, he had very difficult situation with breathing. And so all of us have been touched by this, you know, both on the economic side and on the personal side, but um, we're a resilient community and we are going to weather this. We've done this, we've, we've experienced tough times before and demonstrated that we're, we come back stronger than ever. And I have 100% confidence we're going to do the same thing here. Yeah, I appreciate that. How confident are you of the Dodgers playing this year? That would be nice. And um, I think we could use some good news at any point in time. So I'm, I'm looking at Major League Baseball. I think their plan to have the games in Arizona in a safe way that we can watch on TV would be a great uh, stress reliever right now. Yeah, well, I, I don't see it happening in Arizona, but uh, at least now we can watch them on TV since we won't be able to go to the games in, in a complete switch from last year, the last seven years. You know, I saw, unfortunately, that uh, Vin Scully uh, fell and injured himself and is in a hospital in Los Angeles. And um, it just, you know, brings home how vulnerable we all are to um, disease and infirmary. And this, this just underscores how important it is that we all look out for each other and protect each other and, and do the simple things that you need to do on a daily basis washing your hands, wearing a face covering when you um, go outside, staying six feet away from people, disinfecting surfaces. These seem like simple things, and they are, but they're incredibly effective, and, the, and the, the power of that is demonstrated by the fact that we have bent the infection curve. We have created capacity in our medical facilities to meet uh, a future surge. We just need to stick with it and keep going until we get, we get to a better place. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I've listened to Vin Scully's voice my entire life, and I, I can't com contemplate life without him. So, um, Greg, on behalf of NewsHawk's audience, I can't thank you enough for your time and candor today. This has been informative, and I had fun chatting with you, uh, despite the hiccups. <laughs> but um, would love to do it again. Um, to our readers, listeners, and viewers, um, I want to thank you for your time and your patience as we uh, work through these technical difficulties. I promise you the third time will be the charm. Um, but please give us your feedback. I'm not sure I should, uh, I should try to make a career out of this um, webcast thing, but uh, I'm sure having fun doing it. Email your ideas to, the, to news at newshawk.com and we have some other information on the screen for you. Check back uh, with, on NewsHawk for our next NewsHawk Talks and let me know if you have suggestions for guests. Um, thank you again, Greg, uh, to you and your staff at the county, um, especially Ashley, who, uh, who uh, shepherded through a lot of this, uh, the, the details um, over the last week. And everybody have a great weekend. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bill.